we're not actually sitting in the EU in case it, that had passed people by. Um, I, I'd like to ask the panel members, perhaps I'll start with Casper, but um, is this just an EU fantasy? How is the EU going to enforce um, the legislation which it's going to put in place, both as regards products that are going to be produced outside the EU and sold into the EU? And also, is it really just imposing a drag on its commercial enterprises within the EU in a way that's going to make them less competitive when selling their products into other jurisdictions? How are we going to do it? How is the EU going to do it? I mean, is it is it just regulating for the EU within the EU's borders? Well, at least it's a coherent approach. I think the EU it, it, it kind of believes in, in, in kind of taking leadership in, I mean, in, in this. So so, uh, um, but 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 clearly, I think that's one of the challenges: is that it's only one part of the, the whole global market. Uh, uh, but but of course, I mean. The EU is, is clearly looking for different type of instruments, how to kind of extend its impact beyond the borders of the EU, either kind of by, by sort of forcing that on supply chains or, or uh, sort of uh, customs on, 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 on carbon or, or, or similar type of, of approaches. So, so let's be specific. I mean, the, I mean the, we saw the EU start talking about uniformity within the single market, um, a level playing field within the EU, amongst the EU members. But how do you monitor, how does the EU propose to monitor or enforce its regulation on a, say, a, a UK producer that wants to sell its products into the EU? How is it going to work? Is, is that over to you? Is, are the third party verifiers in the UK? going to be good enough for the EU, or do you have to get an EU third party verifier to put a certificate on your product if you're an English company selling into the EU? How's it going to work? It's a good question, and it's one which I think is, to a certain extent, to be determined, um, because it, it... We haven't got much time, like 2013? Uh, yeah, well, it's, 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 it's the, it's, well, because uh, you know, they've, they've written very, they've written into there, you must be verified by a competent third party. Define competent. Um, who, who is or is not competent and how is that, is that going to be governed by a list? Is it going to be governed by um, standards? I think my, if, if I, my, my uh, take on this would be that we're going to see uh, kind of the standards ecosystem and the quality ecosystem really step into gear here. Um, and so uh, the, just uh, literally on Thursday last week within the, the ISO ecosystem, a proposal has been progressed um, to uh, evolve the ISO Net Zero guidelines. International Standards Organization. International right, Standards yeah. Organization, exactly. Uh, to, to, to turn the ISO Net Zero guidelines, which were launched uh, a little more than a year ago, and turn them into a full ISO standard for net zero aligned organizations. Um, and I think this kind of convergence onto standards that sit within our quality infrastructure where you have a standard you have uh, accreditation bodies like UCAS who will create accreditations uh, so that people can be certified against that standard I think we'll start seeing these sorts of things come onto the international kind of quality landscape that will enable people to have equivalency in their recognition their certifications their accreditations I think the EU has been leading the way on this with uh, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Um, and so the, the key thing now will be how other markets actually catch up and make sure that they are you know, coming towards being on par with CSRD. Um, so for example, we're now waiting, uh, we expect US Security and Exchange Commission should be announcing their final carbon reporting rules in April this year now. Um, so it's going to be interesting seeing are the US going to try and do sort of equivalent reporting requirements to, to the EU? Are they going to branch away from it? And we've seen a UK government consultation in December, just gone, which was asking should we align the scope three reporting requirements with streamlined energy carbon reporting, SECA, with the uh, international standards for uh, reporting that have come out from I apologise for all the acronyms, but the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures is now becoming IFRS um, from the International Sustainability Standards Board, 
um, and essentially the UK government are going to everyone's going to align with that I think um, and so it's going to be about how do we get equivalency and streamline all the acronyms so that we just have one Please. standard to rule. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've also been involved a bit in standardization and for example the life cycle analysis third party review is also kind of a standardized but I'm a bit worried because the standardization work is so slow mm. it takes years so how how is it going to work if kind of a if everything needs to be standardized and really kind of a, how do I say because we are in an urgent uh, climate uh, how would I say climate crisis so we cannot wait for five years to have standardization in place so the timeline of the proposal is to have an ISO net zero aligned organization standard by COP30 which is uh, for those in the know is in Brazil in November next year so they're on an extremely accelerated time scale for those who are familiar with how long it takes to get standards out normally um, and uh, the team behind it are very ambitious. I sit on the BSI committee, so I have sight of uh, everything that's going on, and uh, they are pursuing this aggressively. But how does it work? So if I'm an English company and I sort of tell a fib on a product which I sell into the EU with the benefit of a certificate granted by my friendly English certifier, um, what, does the, what does the EU do about it? If, if, if it's inaccurate or wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I now, think it's if, it, if it's accurate and true, that's great. But let's assume I just tell a fib on my product, in my English product, you're a nice, friendly English certifier. <laughs> of course, you want to see an English company do well, so you grant me the certification, but it turns out to be a fib. What does the EU do about it? Um, I think it would be similar to wider advertising standards. Um, you know, we, we have watchdogs in place that are already... But I'm not, but I'm not in the EU. Uh, my company is in England. And my English advertising standard doesn't care about advertising in the EU. So who's going to get me? It depends on what you're doing. If you're marketing your product in the EU, then the, the action would be against the advert or marketing that you have placed within the EU, I would, I would presume. But how do uh, consumers in the EU take action? How do regulators in the EU get at me because I'm sitting in the UK? You can stop me selling the product. But how do you how how does the compensation work? Uh, it's it's an extremely valid question. As uh, <laughs> as, 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 as uh, sitting next to a legal mind like your own, uh, Richard, I, I, I would hope for, for some insight from you on this. <laughs> well, we'll, okay, we'll come up. With that. <laughs> I, I just would like to add here that you know really concrete action is is and the consequence is that you cannot bring the products to the EU market. But yeah, yeah, that's the ultimate consequence, yeah. I guess, that they can enforce is that you can't sell it here. That's yeah. that sort of. So they, they stop it at the borders. And and my guess is that there are there will also be, for example, NGOs and, and organisations mm. like that who will also keep an eye on the products that enter the EU market. Yeah, we're going to come on. To, I'll I'll come on to the question of litigation sp sponsored by either NGOs or consumers in a minute. But um, you see, it's very good for a company like Metza who has sustainability and um, at, at its heart. I mean, I assume it's in your interests to back the uh, sort of enforcement on a, on a practical level, because it will mean that you are not operating on a playing field which isn't level. You don't want your competitors from outside the EU operating with a different perspective, presumably. Yes, and, and in general, it's, it's very much in our values, in our company values as well, to, to, to kind of promote sustainability. So in, in that sense as well. But, but the trouble is, from an investor's point of view, if I'm investing, if I'm a pension fund investing in Metsa, I don't want you spending loads of money on sustainability unless you can translate it into the bottom line. Yeah, but now, this is a very interesting question, because I've, I've also been involved in our new sustainability reporting, and it goes really much into details, and actually, how we did it is that we now have in our financial uh, department uh, a, a very competent uh, young woman whose title is ESG uh, controller and, and she is, is placed in our finance team and the finance team is, is responsible also for the sustainability data. So my guess is that um, even probably at some day also the, the value of the company is more and more also assessed not only on the basis on the financial data, but also on the basis of sustainability data. But, but, but over to the other side, when you advise big corporates on tactical awareness, I mean, how do you advise them now? 
mean, where should they, they be putting their efforts? Is it to get the quality product at the lowest price, or is it putting money into, sustain, into sustainability that they can prove to consumers? You know, where, where is the cost-benefit analysis? It probably varies a bit in which business you are in. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of... Uh, Casper, can I just ask you to... Yeah, sure, sure, yeah, Sorry. Uh, so, so I think, uh, I mean, there's, there's clearly there's, there's industries where, where you can see, uh, you can see a, a, uh, a clear uh, business proposition in, in, in kind of being a, a first mover and, and, uh, okay, well, a, well, well, take, and a market leader. Take, and, and take, and take a random forestry company, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, they make a toilet paper, right? Do customers care? that the toilet paper they are buying and using is sustainable? Or do they just want the cheapest, or the nicest softest. feeling, softest <laughs> piece of toilet paper? How do you advise them about putting money into this sort of activity when it's, it may not go through to the bottom line? I think, I, I think it's perhaps a kind of twofold thing. You, because it, you, you either are, you, you are amongst the first movers, and then you can clearly get a, a benefit out of it. And then for, for the rest, it, it starts to be not just so kind of uh, responsibility and sustainability, but much more compliance. And then it, it's, it's more kind of, and then it's more about kind of 